Hey guys, how's it going? It's Andrea here, and you are listening to the Pranzetta Podcast. We have a solo episode today of just me. So before we get into it, don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit like. Um, if you're into this kind of thing and you want to stick around weekly, I do weekly music covers and podcasts. I rotate them where one week is a podcast and then the other week is a music video. Soon to come original music as well. Um, for my podcasts, I interview musicians. I interview comedians. I interview business owners, artists of any kind. And sometimes I do solo podcasts like this as well, where I take questions and answers. So if you're into that kind of thing, don't forget to hit subscribe and let's get into it. So today I'm going to be doing a question and answer podcast. I'm actually really excited about this podcast because the last time I had a question and answer, I felt like it gave me some direction for the podcast and everything just flowed naturally with the questions. So um, I was really into that and figured I would put some more questions up there. The last time people asked me very like deep, very um, philosophical questions. And I had a few philosophical questions today, but a lot of my questions this week were ridiculous. So I'm really excited for this particular episode because there's gonna be some uh, pretty funny questions and pretty interesting questions this week. Um, just a little check-in with me and where I'm at today. Um, I feel like my shoulders are very stiff today. I don't know, you know, if anybody else, any of my listeners, you know, deal with that, leave that in the comment section below. But ye yesterday I had one of those days where I was running a bunch of errands and I had like a huge list of things that I needed to do. And I don't know if any of you guys get like this, but I was just in go mode. Like I was just focused. I'm like, all right, got to do this task, got to do this task. And, um, you know, I had a whole bunch of tasks and I was like a little too serious, like a little too into it. So by the end of the day, like, I feel like I was probably like, you know, tensing my shoulders the whole time. So now today I'm paying the price. I'm suffering. Um, I need a massage soon. Um, I did a little yoga this morning, you know, before I woke up, I woke up seven o'clock and I was like, all right, I have to start work at eight 30. I'm going to get up early, do my yoga. And I don't know why, but does anybody else feel like yoga is really hard? Um, I lift weights and I do like high intensity workouts and I still feel like yoga is harder than all of that. Um, I don't know if it's because I was sore. So like holding those downward dog positions like really hurt or something, but I don't know. Like um, what comes to mind is like, does anybody remember that gym commercial? I don't remember the name of the gym, but either it's like, it's a commercial for people that hate meatheads or it's a commercial for just meatheads. I can't remember. It's like, um, I pick things up and I put them down. I feel like I'm that like gym meathead where I'm just like, I want to pick things up and put them down. I don't want to think about all these like weird, awkward angles and stuff like that. So, um, I feel like yoga is a huge challenge for me because it's like a lot of focus, a lot of mental focus. So yeah. So where are we? Sore today, did a little yoga today, right after this podcast, I'm going to go do, um, an open mic comedy set at a place called Scotty's in North Jersey. So I don't know if anybody's from like the New York, New Jersey area, but Scotty's in Union, New Jersey. So I'm really excited about that. So, all right, let's get into it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to put these questions in any, well, actually I am going to put them in a particular order. So I'm going to jump around with what I think should go first. Um, and then I'm going to cross them out so I don't forget any. So first question is, I'm going to go with this one first because it touches on a lot of important stuff. First question is by Etzel513. Etzel513 asks, are you still moving to Texas? Very good question. I thought this would be, let me cross it out. I thought um, this would be an appropriate thing to start with because that's a really big thing for me this week. So um, for spring break, for those of you who don't know, you know, um, I teach part time at a location right now just for privacy's privacy sake. I don't want to tell you where it is, but um, the kids are having their spring break and I decided to take a trip to Austin, Texas to then make that decision this week if I am, well, not this week, April, I'm going to be going April 1st through April 5th. So pretty much like a week away. So next week, a week and a half ish away, um, I'm going to be in Austin, Texas to be making that decision. Um, and for those of you who follow this podcast already, you know, you know, from January, I made a video for New Year's talking about my New Year's resolutions. And I mentioned that I was going to, probably be moving to Austin, Texas, most likely. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be doing it in this. Okay, let me explain. So my lease is over in November. 
So November is about six, seven months away. So I wasn't sure if I was going to be moving in six or seven months or if I was going to wait till the next year term, which would be then a year and seven months. Um, so <laughs> this spring break, I'm going to be visiting Austin. And I'm, I decided that if I get a vibe that this is a place for me and a place that I want to live. I am, I'm not going to be waiting till the next year lease. I'm going to be making the move right away. So am I still moving to Austin, Texas? The answer is probably, and I'll know for sure this week. In, I'll know for sure two weeks because I'm not going to sit on it for too long. I'm going to go there and I'm going to get a feel for it. I'm going to be there for like four days. I'm gonna be walking around and just like checking everything out, checking out the different neighborhoods. And if it feels right to me, and I, f I feel like my intuition will know pretty quickly, I am going to, boom, I'm gonna make that decision and we're gonna set to go there in six or seven months, which is November, six-ish, six, six -ish, seven-ish months. So yeah, um, really quick, why am I moving, probably moving to Austin, Texas? Um, because this year, or the next upcoming years, I really want to put forth all of my efforts into the entertainment business, meaning music and comedy. Um, I'm a musician, obviously, and just recently this year I started stand-up comedy, and I'm really big into that, into the stand-up comedy world and everything right now. Um, so it was always my dream to move to New York City to pursue music um, and just recently to pursue comedy. That wasn't a dream my whole life but that's like a whole nother story but anyways in this current moment um it is my dream to move to a city and right now the problem with new york city is that because of covid the environment of new york city has changed a lot and austin texas as we know texas is kind of a wild state and um they're a little more free there with their restrictions which you know People are going to get mad at me for talking about this. Um, you know, it might not be a wise idea for me to move to a place that has less restrictions and everything like that. However, um, you know, short story for me, I would much rather, at this point in my life, I would much rather put myself in a dangerous situation to pursue my dreams than to wait on New York City to open. So... Um, that is why I am moving probably to Austin, Texas. We will, I will definitely check in with you guys as soon as I possibly can. You can follow me on Instagram, which is Pranzat. I'll include, um, you know, the name below and everything. Um, P-R-A-N-Z-A-T-A. -A. And if you're interested what I decide to do, I'll probably be posting like, you know, story, you know, sto pictures on my story and everything when I'm in Austin. Um, and then I'll definitely make a post like giving you guys my decision. I'm going to make a pretty quick decision, but I don't know. I have like a pretty good gut feeling about it. So I'm going to say yes for now, but definitely check in with me on my Instagram in like two weeks and I'll let you guys know. So that's that. Am I moving to Austin, Texas? So next question. I feel like this is an appropriate question to go for next because it kind of follows up what I was just talking about with comedy and music. Nigel, <laughs> Nigel asked, I have to admit, I was, a little, I was offended by this question when I first read it. Nigel asks, do you plan on going 100% with your music one day? Nigel, you don't think I'm going 100% right now with my music? <laughs> Um, honestly, in all serious, in all seriousness though, he's not wrong to ask me that because I feel like I'm in a place right now where I'm a little, my attention is definitely diverted right now between comedy and music. So even though I was kind of hurt by this question, he's not wrong to ask it. And it does touch on something that's like been an issue for me lately, um, I know the smartest thing if if I want to reach success probably I mean I could be I could be wrong though but I think probably the smartest thing for me would be to either pick music and really go hard with music or pick comedy and really go hard with comedy and right now I just can't pick you know last year I had to like kind of shave off and kind of trim off my life certain things out of my life I gave up classical music 
Um, there were a bunch of other things that I, you know, gave, I don't want to say give up, but you know what I mean? There were other things that I was like, okay, I can't put my focuses on this. Um, but right now where I'm at, I can't pick between comedy and music. So I don't know if I had to describe it, it feels like right now I'm dating two guys and I'm madly in love with both of them. (laughs) And I have to, I'm going to spend the next couple years getting to know both of them. And then at some point I'm going to have to commit to one. And then the other one's like just going to be my friend, (laughs) if that makes any sense. Um, But right now I'm just not ready to make that decision. So yeah, I feel like that's why, by the way, going back to the Austin thing, that's why Austin is such a good move for me because it is a city that is saturated with music and it is starting to become really saturated with comedy. I should have explained that before. Um, for those of you who don't know, Joe Rogan just moved to Austin, Texas, and he has a huge influence on the stand-up comedy community. And um, he just got signed a $100 million Spotify deal. And one of his goals with this money is to kind of like start a whole new comedy community in Austin, Texas. He wants Austin, Texas to be to to boom um, with comedy. And I really believe that he's going to do that. But anyways, um, that's why I want to go to Austin. But yeah, will I go 100% with my music? Only time will tell. I feel like the next couple years for me are going to be really telling of what career path I should be really pursuing and really following. Um, but definitely at some point I'm going to have to put, it'll never be a hundred percent because the truth is I'm not going to give up music and I'm not going to give up comedy. Um, right now it's kind of like a 50, 50 diverted focus. Um, but at some point it's going to have to be like 70, 30 or 80, 20. Um, who comes to mind right now is actually Bill Burr. Bill Burr is a comedian, but he also plays drums, but he's definitely a comedian. You know, like he, he, he does comedy. That's his main job. And he plays drums on the side and he really loves to play drums. So, you know, I feel like that's going to be me. I'm either going to be a stand up stand up comedian who loves to play music on the side, or I'm going to be a musician who kind of like does comedy on the side, which I feel like that doesn't sound like a, we'll, we'll see, Time, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Time will tell. So as much as I am offended by the question, I need to come to grips with the question because it's a really good question. Um, And just like quick side note, Nigel, um, your name, one of my favorite pastimes with my ex-boyfriend was um, I used to come up with like names. I used to like pretend that I was a bitchy housewife, like just to fuck with him. And I would give him all these names that sounded like a good name you can yell at your husband. Like I would be like, Charles, or <laughs> I would be like, what did I do? Um, Charlie was a big one. Gunther, <laughs> I'd go Gunther. So I had all these names, like just to kind of like pretend I was this like bitchy housewife. I'd be like, Gunther, do the dishes. I feel like Nigel would be a perfect, like your wife or your, you know, your mother or your wife probably had so much fun. Like, like whoever marries you one day is going to have so much fun being like, Nigel, <laughs> I feel like your, your name is like the perfect, I'm going to use your name on my next boyfriend when I feel like bitching at them. So thank you, Nigel, for that question. And thank you for knowing me so that I can learn your name. Okay. Next question. We're going to go to one of the silly questions. So <laughs> Evan Bailey X, I'm going to go right to Evan Bailey X. Evan Billy X is my friend in the New Jersey stand-up comedy scene. And he asked me three questions. <laughs> Two of them are jokes. And then the third one is a genuine question. So let's start with the joke question. Question number one by Evan Bailey X. Where did you bury the bodies? <laughs> so first of all, fuck you. Second of all, my answer to you is we'll find out tonight because I'm doing stand-up tonight at Scotty's and you're going to be there. So, um, your body will be buried. I'll bury you alive there. (laughs) Okay, next question by Evan Bailey X. Is mayonnaise an instrument? So again, fuck you. But second of all, you know, I was actually going to get, because I read this question in advance, I was actually going to get a bottle of mayonnaise and try to make 
a, like a song out of it. And then I told one of my friends about the idea and he was like, you know, this is from SpongeBob SquarePants, right? And I was like, oh, come on. You've got to be kidding me. So you gave me a question. This wasn't even your question. This wasn't even your question. You you stole this from SpongeBob. Um, and I'm mad about this for several reasons. But for one, those who follow me know one of my biggest insecurities is that I didn't watch a lot of TV and I didn't watch a lot of movies growing up. So if I didn't know from my friend that this was from SpongeBob SquarePants and I actually went through with this like musical instrument thing with the bottle of mayonnaise, I would have looked like a fucking idiot. So thank God for my friend for warning me ahead of time. So fuck you for tapping into one of my biggest insecurities and almost making a fool out of me for showing the world that I don't know anything by SpongeBob SquarePants, okay? Next. Then he asks me a serious question. So Evan Bailey X asks, what are your tie what are your top five music genres? Um, I feel like they have changed these days. Right now I'm into a lot of okay, I'm actually gonna write these down as I say them so I don't miss anything. So these aren't in any particular order. I can't honestly say that I have a favorite genre because I kind of flip between all these genres. Um, so don't think that one is the top one. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is hip hop. So that's one hip hop. Number two, I'm going to say rap. I'm really into rap these days. Um, number three, I'm going to say, I don't want to say jazz because I have been studying jazz lately from one of my friends. Shout out to Aton. I've already shouted him out on a different episode, but he's an amazing teacher. Um, amazing musician. Um, but I've been studying jazz from him and I'm not, I'm not so much into like the old fashioned classic jazz. I'm more into some of the jazz harmonies and the jazz sounds in a contemporary way. So I guess we could call it neo jazz, I guess, or jazz fusion, but let's just call it neo jazz, neo jazz. Okay. So we need two more, um, classic rock. I really like, I'm an old soul. And I like a lot of classic rock, like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, like that type of stuff. Um, And then the next I'm going to say is R&B, because I'm really into like new R&B and old R&B. I'm really into um, really into Amy Winehouse, which is kind of like a mesh of all these things. She's like R&B, hip hop, neo jazz. Like she's like all the things. So that's probably why I really like her. Um, I really like like Al Green, like old R&B and stuff like that. Like soul, I really like soulful music. So let's read the list again. And again, this isn't any in any particular order. It's just five that I would say is my shit right now. Hip hop, rap, neo jazz, classic rock, and R&B. I would say that pretty much sums up. And there's more. I, I, I hate to be that person, but I feel like I'm that person who's like, I like all music except country, which like, I feel like is such a generic thing to say. It's like what everybody says in in, in their questions. Um, But it's kind of true. Like I I really, you know, as a, when I was younger, I only liked like punk and and classic rock and stuff. And I was like, everything else, they're just posers, you know, kind of attitude. But I feel like these days, as I've developed as a musician, I've really opened my mind up um, to a lot of different genres. So these aren't the only five, but I would say right now, this is the top five. Okay, so we've asked Evan Bailey's stupid questions. Um, okay, next. Another dumb question followed by a good question. So Lazy Eyed Wanderer asks, so first he asked me two questions. His first dumb question is, do you like frogs? And he's probably fucking with me, but I'm gonna answer the question. Um, do I like frogs? I, I guess, honestly, my short answer would be no, because I, I haven't, I don't hate frogs. I don't dislike frogs, but I've just, I haven't had like frog experience. Like I've never eaten frog legs. I've never dissected a frog in high school. I, I don't see frogs like ever. Um, but, and I'm not like, I'm not like really, like I'm not like dying to see a frog or anything. Like, um, like I really like cats, you know what I mean? Like, and, and there's certain animals that I would love to see frog wouldn't be the first thing that comes across my mind but i honestly can't say because like if i lived in a climate or if i lived in an environment where if i saw a frog walking down the street is where do, i don't even know where, see i don't know anything about frogs i don't know where they are 
Um, but if I saw a frog, I'd, I'd probably be really curious about it just because, um, like I said, I don't really have any frog experience, but am I like into them? No, I, I guess my short answer would be no, I don't like frogs. Um, and then he follows up with a serious question. So lazy eyed wanderer asks, what song do you wish you wrote? That's a really good question. Um, Pretty much anything, my answer to that would be pretty much anything by Billie Eilish because I feel like, you know, I'm going to be re- releasing my first single this year and um, there's a couple other other singles that I want to release as well. We'll see if I can get them out this year, but probably next year for the other ones. Um, I feel like when I was younger, I've always had like a creepy style, like I was really into creepy music and like carnival gypsy like weird type of music um and people like when I was younger people always thought I was weird because of that they're always like you're weird you're so weird and um I feel like if I had written a song when I was younger it would definitely be like some type of creepy song um but I was like shy or embarrassed to show that side of me to people and now Billie Eilish like she has like probably okay so my answer to the question would be bury a friend by bury a friend i'm i'm gonna bury evan bailey alive today if you guys were listening to this 10 minutes ago where did i bury the body see (laughs) um but yeah definitely bury a friend by billy eilish because like i said you know back in the day i always had this like fear of showing that side of me and now billy eilish could pay for my entire student loan debt with that song. So um, I definitely fucked that up by not just kind of like, I guess if I, I guess this is a good like lesson for everybody. If, if you're like some type of musician or artist, or it doesn't even have to be that, if you're any type of person, if there's like a weird side of you that you're afraid to show people, that's probably the side that you should be showing people because that's the side of you that makes you you. And especially as an artist, like, you should be weird and be crazy and not be afraid of that because that's people like that especially now everybody's like trying everyone's like dyeing their hair purple and like getting tattoos i've been guilty of all those things but everybody's like going out of their way to try to be different so it's like now now above all times like don't be afraid of being weird because you know people want to be people want to be weird now when i was younger i was afraid to be weird but now it's like i'm not even weird there's so many weirdos out there um Okay, Lazy Eye Wonder, we got him. Next, Theolone. Theolone asks, how do you deal with anxiety? Uh, Zoloft. <laughs> so I take antidepressants, um, not because I'm depressed. I mean, I've been been depressed, but um, antidepressants also work for anxiety and panic attacks. So I actually used to have really, really bad panic attacks. And I would say like four or five years ago, um, I had like a really bad twitching issue um, because I had so much anxiety. Like um, I still kind of have like weird twitches and stuff, but it was really bad. I kept like twitching my neck constantly. And I went through it. I was like always moving my neck. Um, and I think it's because like my thoughts were racing. So like I just couldn't like calm my energy down. Um, and then I do notice like if I'm if I'm getting anxiety anymore, which I don't as much these days because of the medication, but um, I will notice if I'm getting anxiety, I'll get very like twitchy kind of thing. Um, But yeah, I used to have like twitches and like really bad panic attacks and anxiety attacks and social settings and public and everything like that. Um, And I hate to say it, but when I went on Zoloft, it actually did completely change my life. A lot of people are afraid of taking here's the thing I, if you don't have serious anxiety if your anxiety is mild i think you should probably learn how to deal with it on your own through natural remedies like yoga and deep breathing but if you're if it's at the point where you're having like frequent panic attacks and you're antisocial, and um i was having like um i don't even want to say like like it's 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 too much to even like talk about maybe one day i'll talk about it talk about it but i was having like really weird thoughts like on the regular in public when I was around people um, that literally would make me sound like I was schizophrenic if I told you. So I'm I'm just not going to get into it, but definitely a lot of anxiety. And, um, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the side effects, like the potential side effects that could come with antidepressants. I would say the two main ones that people are afraid of would be weight gain and 
loss of sexual libido. I feel like that's the two, especially men with the sexual libido, they don't, you know, I feel like sexuality is like such a, and it's also part of a woman too, but like it for men, it's like it, their ego is very much attached to their sexuality. So for men, um, they're afraid of the loss of libido. And for women and men too, they're like afraid of the weight gain. I can tell you, um, I'm on a, I'm not even a high, I, apparently I'm on like a low dose. I don't know the milligrams exactly, but the doctors told me that like whatever the lowest dose is, is what they gave me. Um, so I didn't even need that much, but um, didn't gain weight. I actually, I lost weight. I lost 20 pounds when I went on um, antidepressants, when I went on Zoloft, because the thing is my anxiety attacks were so severe that I was like, I got to the point where I would barely leave my house and I would just sit around and lay in bed all the time. So once I um, went on the medication, within t- two months, I lost 20 pounds because I, was, I wasn't I was laying in bed anymore. I was like getting up and doing things. I have a theory about the weight gain. I don't think the medic, there are serious medications that will make you gain weight, but this is like the heavy duty stuff, like lithium, like those types of things really mess with your chemistry. I mean, and that's for severe mental illness, like, you know, schizophrenia, stuff like that. But if you're talking just like generic over, uh, not over the counter, you know what I mean? If you're talking about just the generic, like anti-depression, you know, medication that they give, um, like Zoloft and whatever, Lexapro, I don't know. I don't know what they are. Um, I just know I have Zoloft. My theory with that is people do report like 10 pound weight gain, but I think it has to do because there's a thing like I lost 20 pounds, but someone else might gain 10 pounds. There is a weight thing associated with it, but I think it doesn't have anything to do with the medication itself. I think it has to do with the behavior change that comes with the medication. And this is just my theory. I'm not a doctor. I don't know, but that's, you know, my philosophy with it is like, so if you were the type of person that would never eat because you were depressed, well, then you might gain weight because when you're not depressed, you will start eating. You know what I mean? Um, But if you're the type of person who overeats when you're depressed, which I was, when I'm depressed and anxious, I overeat. So when I, when I went on the medication, I lost weight because I wasn't overeating anymore. But again, if you're the type of person who like lays in bed and can't even get out of bed to cook, well then obviously when you get out and you start cooking and going out to eat with your friends, you're going to gain weight. I don't think it has to do with the medication itself. I think it's a behavioral change and that's going to be different for everybody. So, uh, you know, don't worry about the weight gain and the sexual libido thing. I, uh, <laughs> I definitely didn't have that problem. Um, if anything, it went the other way because like I said, I wasn't depressed anymore. And honestly, for, for men, like I have like a joke about this. I wouldn't worry about the sexual, the loss of sexual libido thing, because the thing is, imagine how much like work you can get done and how, how much more you're going to be able to focus if you have a lessened sexual. I have a friend who doesn't have a very high sexual libido and he's the most productive person in the entire world. And he's way ahead of the game because he's not like distracted by women and he's not distracted by like trying to impress women. He just like focuses on his work. So that's like my um, go-to with that is like, well, if you do, who cares? You can just focus on so many other things, but I don't even think that's going to happen because it didn't happen to me. So I wouldn't worry about that. All right, so that's for the alone. How do you deal with anxiety? Oh, really quick with that too. Another thing was reducing my caffeine intake um, because when I, I, I honestly sometimes wonder if this is the reason why I was having anxiety attacks. When I was younger, I didn't read the instructions of how much coffee you're supposed to put when you make a pot of coffee. Um, I like to make coffee the old fashioned way. I don't use a Keurig and I didn't realize that you're supposed to put like one tablespoon for the whole pot. I was putting one tablespoon per cup of water, (laughs) which is insane. So I was having like sometimes like, like uh, I was having like sometimes like 10 times the amount of coffee than a regular like traditional coffee pot. So I think that that might be why I was having like weird, crazy, like, schizophrenic thoughts because I was just having so much coffee that I was probably high. Um, I was probably having like, um, 
I was, I was probably hallucinating from the coffee. So yeah, once I actually learned how to brew coffee the right way, if you have a Keurig, then you don't have to worry about that because it's already like pre-made. But once I reduced my coffee intake and went on antidepressants, took care of the anxiety. I'm like a completely different person now. Okay, next. Musician Ange asks, how did you learn to love cooking? Um, this has, I feel like this one kind of has like a deep answer, I guess you could say. When I was younger, I didn't really have like a close relationship with my mother. Um, I mean, I did when I was really, really younger, but I'm talking like when I was becoming a woman, when I was like 12, 13, 14, around that age, I didn't have a very close relationship with my mother. Um, so I don't know, I always had this insecurity that I wasn't feminine, you know? Like people always kind of called me a tomboy. Um, and sometimes they still do call me a tomboy. Um, but I always like, I never took this as a compliment. I always was really offended by this. Um, Cause I like, I mean, I like being strong. Like I like being a strong woman, but I still want to be a strong woman. I don't want to be a tomboy, you know what I mean? Like I, I want to um, embrace being a woman and I want to be feminine. So I don't know. I think cooking for me, when I learned how, started to learn how to cook, it was a way for me to embrace my feminine side. Um, I have an aunt that is a really good cook and she's, you know, really into, you know, the homemaking thing. Like she can cook really well. She hosts, you know, these big, amazing parties. And like I said, I feel like because I didn't have that close relationship with my mother, um, my aunt and I had gotten really close much later in life, like when I was maybe 21, 22. Um, I mean, we were close when I was like five or six, but there was like a huge gap of time where we weren't close with each other. And we just kind of, I don't know, went our separate ways with life. She got busy and whatever. And, um, then she kind of came back in my life when I was like 22. I don't know. I probably said 21 before, but I feel like now that I think about it, it was more like 22, 23. And once she came into my life, I observed, this was like one of the first times in a while where I had a feminine figure in my life. And she was extremely feminine with her cookings, you know, her cooking abilities. And, you know, she was a mother and she has children and everything like that. So I feel like I kind of learned to love cooking just by observing her cooking and kind of feeling this like nurturing thing that I was craving. So you take that, like the like me kind of observing the love she had for cooking. And then to top that off, I worked in the restaurant business for many years. Like I worked in the restaurant business since I was like 18 and I stayed in the restaurant business till I was like 25. Like, I don't know, something around seven, eight years, something like that. And, um, so I learned like naturally I picked up on a lot of ingredients and recipes just from being in the restaurant business. So you take these two things and combine them. And, um, I feel like by learning the recipes from the restaurant business and just like memorizing the menus and kind of experimenting in the kitchen by myself, I learned how to be a, I think I'm a really good cook. I've had, you know, boyfriends tell me, and that's another thing. Like I, I learned that, um, by embracing that feminine side of cooking. And, and I don't, I don't want to say cooking is only feminine because there's like a, a lot of amazing male chefs. I don't really, you know, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble or something for saying that. But I understand that in today's society, there isn't really an assigned like, okay, women cook and men do this. I don't mean that. But I just mean, I just mean for me personally, for me, I associate cooking and serving as a feminine thing. And I don't mean that in a bad way. To me, it's actually a good thing. And um, once I started dating and I started cooking for my boyfriends, to me, that was, to me, that was a way, like if I cook for you, it's because I adore you. And if I'm dating you and I stop cooking for you, it's because I'm starting to resent you, you know, kind of thing. So to me, cooking, you know, became a way for me to like really show my love to the boyfriends I dated and stuff like that. So really, that's how I learned how to love cooking was just, you know, associating it with this feminine quality that I really wanted to embrace. And, you know, I love 
I love cooking for people. That is something that I definitely picked up from my aunt um, because she would cook for people and there would just be so much joy in her spirit. Um, and she would just have such a big smile on her face from feeding me even, like from feeding me or feeding her kids and watching people enjoy her meals. So I just kind of picked up on that as this like amazing you know, feminine thing, you know, that I could do. So that's why I learned how to love cooking. And not only that, but I like to take care of my body and I like to eat healthy. So another way that I, another reason why I love cooking is because I know exactly what's going into my body. And that's another thing. Like I pick all the ingredients. I, so I know exactly what I'm taking in. You can go out to eat and get a salad or whatever, but you don't really know what's, you know, you don't know, um, Okay, all right, here's a good example. Like when you go out to get, for example, Hawaiian pizza at a, at a pizzeria. I like Hawaiian pizza, the pizza that has pineapples on it. Well, sometimes I wonder, like, how do I even know if the pineapples are real, actually cut pineapples or if they're just like canned pineapples? And a lot of those canned pineapples, they throw extra sugar in it and they throw like weird additives and syrup. So it's just like stuff like that. It's like, if I want a Hawaiian pizza, I want to know that that is like a fresh cut pineapple you know, type of thing. So that's really important to me. So I, that's another reason why I love cooking. Besides the fact that it's like a feminine thing for me, I just love knowing exactly what's going inside my body. So, you know, that's it. Um, I guess my guess would be you're asking me this because you want to start cooking or, you know, I know we're friends, musician and we're friends and you follow my Instagram. So maybe you also want to start cooking. Honestly, just start doing it, you know. Um, for me, it was kind of like, a creative process. I mean, you're a musician, you know, so um, the way I see it, it's like a creative process. It's very, um, it's very intimate. It's very like, like, I don't like to follow instructions. They say that there's cooks and there's bakers, bakers, bakers. It's like a science. It's like a science. You have to have this much flour, this much, this, this much that for me, I don't want to deal with that. I'm that's not the way I am. I'm very like, I like to just go with the flow type of thing when it comes to creating things. Um, so for me, it's just about like literally smelling things, you know, uh, when you go out to eat, just like observe what's on your plate and take that information in, or just think about a dish your mother made and just try to recreate it. You're probably going to screw up sometimes. That's how you learn. You know, I've screwed up many a dishes on my own, uh, by just like kind of teaching myself how to cook, but it's just like anything else. The more you do it, it's like practicing piano. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more you learn and, you know, continue to read, like read about different recipes and stuff like that. So yeah, I think if you want to cook, you could definitely learn to love how to cook and get into, you know, taking care of your body and stuff like that. Um, it definitely helps to have someone to cook for too. Cause like I said, you feel really good when you see someone eat your meal. So maybe, like cook a meal for you and your parents or you and your, you know, boyfriend, whoever, your friend. Um, anyways, I feel like I gave that a long answer, but I, I felt like that was like a personal question to me in a way, cause it touches my heart. Um, okay. A couple more questions. Okay. I'm going to go. Okay. I'm going to leave this person's name anonymous because I know they'd be embarrassed if I said their name, but this anonymous person asked me, do people really enjoy the smell of their own farts? I'm seriously asking. <laughs> so first of all, this is my friend. I'm not going to say her name. This friend of mine is obsessed with farts. Like it's all she talks about. Like if I'm like, I'll, I'll message her like, hey, I'm, I'm going out on a date. And she'll be like, did you make sure you get all your farts? <laughs> she'll, she'll be like, make sure you get all your farts out so you don't fart on the date. Or, or she'll be like, make sure, you know, if he comes over at night, Make sure you kick them out at a certain time because after, you know, after you guys get frisky with each other, you're going to need to fart and you're, <laughs> she's, she's like, farts are always on her mind. She's got like this fart thing. So I'm going to, I'm again, I'm going to take all these questions seriously and I'm going to look up the answer and we're going to look at, we're going to find out right now. Do people like the smell of their own farts? I'm going to look up the science behind this. While I'm looking, I'm going to say that personally, I don't want to say I don't like mine because then, then it sounds like mine are disgusting. I don't mean it like that. I just mean like, I don't, I don't like love it. Like, like I'm not like, mm, like, you know what I mean? Um, I guess I could tolerate it. I could tolerate mine better than other people's. I don't like, I'm not like into the smell of my own farts, but I have met people who said they were. One of my uncles like 
talked about it all the time. He said he like actually likes the smell of his own farts. So let's, do you like, do you like the smell of your own farts? Missy, Miss Anonymous? Um, let's find out. Do people like the, or, or we're, gonna, we're gonna ask this, why? Because apparently some people do. Why do people like the smell of their own farts? <laughs> By the way, I'm using my work laptop to look this up, so I really hope that they don't. Oh, okay. There's an, okay. I really hope that they don't like look up the search engine history because they're gonna be like, "What the hell is this?" Um. Okay, this is interesting. This is actually really interesting. Wow, this is, okay, this is actually really good to know. This is really interesting. So science explains why people like this. I don't like mine. I don't know, like, I don't hate mine. I'm not disgusted by mine, but I'm not into mine. But this is really cool. The smell of our our own smell is a sign of our health. We've adapted to like our own smells to help us maintain proper hygiene. We wouldn't be able to take care of our own bodies if we were, were repulsed by our own bodies. Our farts become familiar to us so we can maintain a, a higher level of well-being. So let's look at a second article because I, I feel like that's interesting. I want to see what another article says. Watch, why do we like the smell of our farts? I don't, wait, I was gonna say I don't wanna watch, but I think that's just, no, no, it's a video. I don't, I don't feel like watching a video right now. I just wanna read why we don't think our own farts stink. Oh, I'm getting like a pop-up ad thing. Nope, it's not just you. Anybody with a nose is going to think that their own gas. <laughs> what is happening? Okay, this is just an advertisement. My algorithm's gonna be really weird after looking this stuff up. Um, they're gonna be giving me like advertisements for like, what is it, Beano or gas medication? Um, nope, it's just you. Anybody with a nose is gonna think that, hold on. We like things that are familiar. This one says your brain likes things that are familiar to you. So this is like a different take on it. Let me see if I could see it. I'm just gonna skim, skim through and see if I could see anything else. It says everybody's different. Okay, so the first one, uh, the first one seemed more legit than this one. This is the Washington Post. The other one was an actual like scientific article. Um, this one's just basically saying like everything's different. Um, but I don't know, the first one was really interesting to me and made a lot of sense. Cause it's like, that makes sense. Like, of course we don't like the smell of other people's, but it makes sense that we'd be at least be able to tolerate the smell of our own so we can identify our own health. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's going to smell different every single time. So if, um, if one day it smells weird compared to normal, that could be a sign like, Ooh, I shouldn't have eaten this type of thing. So you need to be able to smell your own to like assess your own health. Um, but yeah, personally, I don't like this. Like, like I'm not like, mm, like, like at the smell of mine, but I have, I have met people who are, like I said, my uncle is like that. I think that's really weird. So I don't know. Comment in the comment section below. Do you like the smell of your own farts? Um, can you just tolerate it? Because it seems to me like you have to be able to just tolerate it to survive. So can you just tolerate it or do you like it? For me, it's just like I tolerate it. I'm okay with it. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Let's see what we have. There is three more questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save the hardest question for last. So I'm going to go with this question. I don't know how to pronounce his... Um, his uh i always said screen name like what is this aol instant messenger whatever name adiatic a d g e a t i c adiatic adiatic whatever um does an artist lack artistic integrity if they don't write or create their own art i'm gonna ask it again so people can understand what it says does an artist does an artist lack artistic integrity if they don't write or create their own art um to me the answer to that would be 
it depends what the art is like so for example um if you're a broadway if you're an actor in a broadway play or an actress in a broadway play you didn't create the lion king but that doesn't make you any less of an artist um because it's a different type of art um so again it really depends on the type of art stand-up comedy totally not cool to take other people's art totally not cool to take other people's jokes um there is something called parallel thinking and this has happened to me many a times um and there's there is also being influenced by somebody that's a lot of that's a lot different than like straight up copying somebody um no matter if you're a musician if you're a comedian whoever you are you you weren't just born like with like you were influenced the reason why you like music is because you heard music and you were influenced by it so obviously you're going to be influenced by different musicians or you're even going to be influenced by different comedians a lot of people that i know like end up picking up on gestures um and like body language of different comedians without even realizing i feel like i do that too i feel like um i'm so influenced by louis ck that i can't even help sometimes like my body language ends up being by like similar to louis ck but it's it's um that's subconscious you don't really realize you're doing it until later you're like oh shit that's totally louis ck or like somebody points it out to you kind of thing but when you straight up take a joke like and you know you're taking a joke and you use it that's not cool in the stand-up comedy community um but but again like the influence thing is okay like body language type stuff or even like similar joke styles but your own version like sometimes that's cool too depending on what the joke is um so that's not cool, but like, like I said, if you're like a, you know, if you're a cover band, um, you know, sure, it's not as much as a creative, but it could, you know, it could be a creative process. Like I have musician friends who they do compose their own music. I am, I compose my own music. I'm in the process of releasing it, but I also cover other bands as well. And I think covering other bands is all, believe it or not, is also a creative process because you're not just imitating. I mean, some people actually do get paid to like imitate a band. I'm not really into that. I think that, I think when you're just imitating a band, like, like there's like, for example, there's some people that are like, I am an Amy Winehouse, like, um, imitator or like an Elvis imitator. And they literally dress exactly like them and copy their exact mannerisms and everything like that. To me, that's like kind of weird. I, I'm not into that type of thing, but people, people pay to see that. Cause they, they're just like really into it. Um, to me, that's weird. But if you're somebody, if you're a musician like myself or like some of my friends where, yes, they write their own music, but on the side, they also cover bands, but they always like put their own spin on it and they make it their own. I think the important thing is to make it your own and, um, you know, to put your other artistic influences on it. Um, and like, just think, do you, is there a song that you know that was covered by another band, but you actually like the cover song better the, what i can think of is um killing me softly um killing me softly is known by the um the fuji fugees um lauren hill you know the singer lauren hill but it originally let's look this up who originally did killing me softly it was somebody else and i i don't i didn't even know this until i looked it up who wrote roberta flack maybe Who wrote Killing Me Softly? Oh, so the original Norman Gimbel. I don't even know who the hell that is because I know the Lauren Hill version. Um, and then another, another example that comes to mind, um, And I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. Well, guess what? Who wrote it? Dolly Parton. So again, I, I don't... Uh, I mean, it is kind of... It, it is, I mean, I guess I will say this. In, in the I Will Always Love You version, it is a little messed up probably that um, Dolly Parton's didn't get as much recognition and that she wrote it. So I get, yeah, I guess that's like a little fucked up now that I think about it. Like if an artist wrote a song, but they barely got any recognition for that and then the person who covers it gets all the recognition, might be a little fucked up, but it doesn't make them any less of an artist because for whatever reason, whatever that person did to the song, the people liked better. You know, the people liked that interpretation. So... I don't know to answer your question again i really think it depends on the art you know um certain arts um especially like 
being an actor in a Broadway play where you didn't write the song, but you're trying to embody the character, that's totally a valid art, you know, to be able to embody the character of somebody else's work. Um, but something like comedy books, like, yeah, obviously if you're an author, you don't want to write someone else's book. You have to r write your own book. Um, so uh, short answer, no, I don't think it makes you less of an artist to um, embody another work and interpret it in a different way. Um, but there are going to be certain art forms that it is. It really depends on the art form. It would be, I guess, the answer to that. Okay. I think there's like two more questions. So did I, I cross that out. We got all those. I'm going to save the hardest one for last because I don't even know how I'm going to answer it. Um, so here's the second, the hardest one to me. Arson the Poet asks, what would you like to be your legacy? Okay, this, <laughs> what would I like to be my legacy? Um, I feel like this question, I can't really answer. Like this is, I feel like this answer is going to change as I go, you know, as my life goes on, it's going to change. Cause I feel like my answer now is different than the answer like five years ago, which is different than the answer 10 years ago. Um, so where I'm at in my life right now, one thing I'm realizing is that whatever you do in this life, it's not going to be fulfilling if whatever you choose to, to do in this life, it's not going to be fulfilling if the only thing in it, the only thing you're in it for is yourself. Like, so for example, I want to be a comedian. I want to be a musician. If I'm just doing that because I want attention and I want everyone to know me and notice me type of thing, um, which I think is like sometimes where a lot of people start. Like, I feel like, I feel like in the beginning phase of wanting to do this, there's a lot of ego in it for sure. Not always. And I'm not even saying with me necessarily either, because I actually really love, um, I love being, I love music. I love playing music and I love stand up comedy. Um, but then where does it become like, okay, I want to do this for a living and I want to find success and fame in this? Well, what I'm getting at is there's nothing wrong with wanting to fulfill that life, with wanting to um, have a life of success and fame and everything like that. But I feel like your heart has to be in it for the right reasons. It shouldn't be about just fulfilling your own desires to be noticed. It should actually be about wanting to help other people. You know, whatever you do, I feel like our purpose in life is to somehow help other people. Um, so right now where I'm at in life, um, and again, this answer could change as I go, but... Um, I've mentioned previously in this episode that I'm really inspired by Joe Rogan and the fact that the fact that Joe Rogan, um, the fact that Joe Rogan landed all this money from Spotify, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to just buy a bunch of shit for himself. I mean, he did buy some shit for himself, but now that he has all this money, like he's spoken about this on his podcast multiple times he wants to find something to do with this money. You know, he wants to find something to do with this money that will make a change in the world. And again, he was very much influenced by Mitzi Shore, I think her name is. And, um, you know, she passed away, but she was a comedian, uh, not even a comedian. I think she was like the head of this comedy club um, in LA. And he believes that she was the reason why so many um, comedians at that time made it big, including himself. He thinks that she is, you know, the reason why he made it big because she saw something in him and, you know, she, she sort of like, she, I, I, I'm just kind of like paraphrasing what he said. So you would have to look like YouTube, like Google or YouTube, Joe Rogan, Mitzi Shore, and probably more will come back, like clips of him talking about it. But from what I gather, um, he was really inspired and influenced by the way she had such an impact on the stand-up community and the way that she kind of created and fostered this environment where comedians weren't being controlled by Hollywood and that they could really express themselves and express what they're really feeling. And so many amazing, crazy, wild comedians were then birthed, were then created um, because of this lady because of the environment that this lady fostered so now fast forward joe rogan has all this money and he wants to kind of like pay it forward he wants to now 
his legacy. He wants his legacy. He wants to now create an environment in Austin, Texas, which is why I'm going to Austin, Texas, where he creates an environment where comedians can be free and express what's on their mind and everything like that. So I'm really inspired by kind of like he was inspired by Mitzi Shore. I'm inspired by him. Like I want to, I want to do something similar with my life. Like, um, I do want success in the entertainment business. Like I want success on this podcast and I want success in comedy and I want success in music, but I do. I also want to like, I feel like for me, the end goal would be to create an environment where I could help people, um, where I could also be in a position where if my podcast becomes successful, um, I could then, I could help people that I think are talented come on here. Like, um, I don't know, like, um, like if I have a, for example, if I have a friend who's like really trying hard to make it big in the film industry or something like that. Um, and let's say I have a successful podcast. Well, I would love to have this person on here and then them to get their word out and then them to find success. If I had to like daydream about my biggest fantasy and my biggest legacy, it would be to pursue this dream for myself, but also mainly for other people to give people a place where they can express themselves, to give people a place where they can find success. So I want to find success so that I can help others find success, if that makes sense, if I put it in a short answer. So yeah, short answer, I want to be, to sum it up, I want to be a successful podcaster and music artist and comedian, and I want to do it in such a way that I can be in a position to help other people become successful, like if I have a successful platform, um, or like if I become a successful comedian or whatever, I can like some of my friends who I think are talented, I could like give them a good word or whatever. And then also I want, I do want to find financial success as well, because I want to, um, then take the money and maybe financially help my family. Like, you know, there, I don't have a lot of money in my family and I would love to be in a position where, um, I'm not going to name names because I'd probably embarrass my family members, but, um, I, there are certain people in my family that I think could use the help. And I would love to be in a position where I do make a lot of money so I could then help certain family members have financial freedom. So yeah, for me, it's like, I want to do this, but I've come to a place in life where I'm realizing it's not just about me. It's actually about other people. So that's, I guess that's what I would want my legacy to be, to um, find success and then help others pa uh, pave the way to success like me, me, me finding the door to the success and then kind of like letting them in. Like, yeah, yeah, I found it. Like, come with me kind of thing. If that makes any sense. Um, okay. Last question. This is the hardest question. Um, I I've, I've been like saving it for last cause I've been avoiding it. Cause it, I don't even know the answer, but I'm going to try my best anonymous. They specifically asked me to, I, I made some other people anonymous, but this person actually asked to stay anonymous anonymous person. How does your perception of reality differ from others? Okay. Um, can you see why I'm avoiding the question? Because I feel dumbfounded by this question. Okay. So I'll say that, first of all, I don't think that, I don't think my perception of reality, I mean, it, okay, it's like a complicated answer. So I'm going to start like this. I don't think any one person has a unique perception of reality. I don't think one person on this earth, myself included, any, okay, anything that I think in my head, I'm not the only person who thinks it. There, there's rare exceptions, like, like Albert Einstein or like Elon Musk. Like there's like these rare geniuses that it's like, no, you're the only person who thought of this. Um, but me, myself, um, and, and I would say the majority of people in the bell curve, I would say the majority of us, even the brilliant ones, like the, in this, in this, you know, curve, there are brilliant people that live here as well, that exist here. Um, I don't think any of us are unique or different necessarily. My, my perception of this is that any ideas that come to me, creative ideas or just like regular thoughts, like philosophical ideas or whatever, um, I think somebody else out there has a parallel thought. Like we're all, I, the thoughts don't come from me. Like whatever thoughts that I have in my head, they're not really coming from me. I feel like, um, 
it's like human being. And I'm not the first one who even said this because again, like we all, like a lot of people say this um, or a lot of people think this. I think human beings are more like antennas and the thoughts from literally the gods, like that's how I perceive it. Like I feel like there's gods and they're sort of like sending these thoughts to the humans that exist on earth. And so if I have an interesting thought or a creative thought, that I feel like, oh, this is something special. I don't really feel like it's coming from me. I feel like I'm just a channel for, like I'm like a radio channel for this thought to come to. And I think that this thought is also parallel coming to um, somebody else or multiple people on this earth. And again, I feel like there are those rare exceptions where like, I feel like the gods choose Elon Musk or choose Albert Einstein or these great geniuses. Like you're the one who's going to have this thought, you know, but even those people, I don't think the thoughts are coming from them. I think for whatever reason they were chosen, you know, by the gods to express something very special. Um, so again, this is like a complicated answer. So I don't really think my reality is unique. Like I think that, um, one thing I'm realizing lately, it's like been kind of one of my little mental mottos lately. And again, I probably am not the one who thought of this. Um, one of my mottos lately is that like when I was younger, I used to think that I like if I met somebody that I connected with, I'd be like, oh, my God, it's like a soulmate. You know, it, it could be like a friend or a lover, like soulmates come in different forms, family, friends, lovers. I would be like, oh, my God, we're so much alike. We're like soulmates. Oh, my God. And as I get older, I realize like we're all soulmates. Like we, we, I think I've said this in a previous episode as well, by the way, but um, I feel like we all have something in common with each other. You just have to get to know somebody or look harder. You can be soulmates with so many different people and so many different people have things in common with each other. And we're kind of all here on earth living a very similar experience. Um, and I've, I've said this in a previous episode as well. It's kind of like, why biblical stories and Greek mythology are so um, are so big is because these are classic stories that all humans can relate to. You know what I mean? So we're all kind of here on this earth living a similar experience. So I don't really think my perception of reality is different from others. I think my perception of reality is um, the same as a lot of people's. Now, obviously, everybody behaves differently. Um, and I'm not the only one who behaves like me. There's a lot of people who behave like me, but there's also a lot of people who behave different from, from me. So n now to kind of answer your question, because like, again, like I don't, I don't think I'm the only one who thinks the way I think, but I do think a certain way. And there is like a group of people, a huge group of people on the planet who think like me as well. I would say that, um, how do I think and what's my reality? I, I would say for me, where I'm at right now, I'm kind of in like a nihilistic mindset. Um, and that sounds depressing. Um, if, if those of you who don't know what nihilism is, it's, I don't, I don't even think I can like define it correctly. You would have to Google, let me, I have the Google right here. What am I talking about? Um, how do I define nihilism? Let's look it up. What is nihilism? Nihilism, the rege oh, <laughs> I don't, okay, maybe I don't know what this word means because, okay, okay, okay. Nihilism, the rejection of all religious and moral principles and the belief that life is meaningless. That's not to say I don't believe in God, so, but I do understand what they're trying to say. It's like, I don't believe in religion in like a set of rules, like this is how things are going to go kind of thing. I think that, um, I think that life is meaningless sounds like a depressing thing but to me it's actually a really powerful thing and it empowers me to think that life could be meaningless and let me explain that because I think life is kind of meaningless I now have the power to give my own life meaning in the way that I want to give it meaning because I don't think that there is anything specific that is meant. That is really, this is, this is why I've been avoiding this question because I can't, it's really hard for me to answer, really hard for me to articulate this. Um, because, because I don't believe in a specific like set of guidelines for my life, 
I now have the freedom to do things like comedy and to pursue music because um, by thinking that life is meaningless, it really kind of numbs like the shame and the fears that go with doing these things. Because now I'm at a point in my life where I'm just like, and maybe it's the, the Zoloft, <laughs> like maybe it's the antidepressants I was talking about, but I'm, I'm at a point in my life where it's like, I feel like I've had a pretty rough life and a really pretty rough childhood. And it, it's gotten it's gotten to the point where it's just like, what next? Like, I, I don't even think anything, like by the time COVID came, I was just like, oh, okay. Like this makes sense. You know, life is, life is crazy in it. And, um, you know, something like COVID, for example, could bring you to a nihilistic place where it's like, it's like, wait a second. I thought we were supposed to go to work and, you know, you work nine to five and you, you do this and you go to church and you come home and you hang out with your friends. And now I live online and like, you know, um, I don't know if I'm going to have a job. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like before we had like such a uh, structured society and since COVID, like it kind of goes to show like, no, like anything can happen at any time. We don't really have anything figured out. Like we, we're not really controlling these circumstances, but because of that, um, you know, it might lead somebody to a depressed place where they think life is meaningless. But I think that to accept the possibility of life being, being meaningless to me, like I said, it allows me to give definition to my life and give purpose to my life. I don't necessarily think that there was been one purpose given to me. I don't really necessarily believe that. Um, I believe that I have the right to choose my purpose and I have the right to define my purpose in this life. And, um, you know, and that's not to say, I don't, I also kind of do believe that some things do happen for a reason, but I feel like the, I feel like the energy and the thoughts that I have drive that reason. You know what I mean? I don't I don't even know if I'm making any fucking sense. If I'm not making any sense, somebody, you know, tell me in the comment section below because I'm honestly having a really hard time articulating this. Um so long story short, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to sum this up in a shorter way for you. Number one, I don't think that my perception of reality is really different because I feel like there's a lot of other people like me who think parallel to me. But among those people who do think parallel to me and then are different from the groups of people who think differently than me, um, I think the reason why I got to a point where I have a more nihilistic perspective of life and um, also more of like a fearless perspective of life. Like I'm, I'm, I, f I feel like I'm pretty fearless at this point in my life. Not to say that I don't have fear because I definitely do, but I'm just saying like I'm able to push through my fears if that makes any sense. I feel like to me, it, it's because I've been through so much at this point in my life where it's just like, I don't even, like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> but because I don't care, it, it allows me to do a lot. It allows me to move, it allows me to move through pain and suffering and humiliation um, and fears. It allows me to move through fear without caring about the fear. I guess that's a better way to put it. It's not that I don't fear anymore. It's just that I don't care about the fear anymore. It's just like, yeah, I know this. I know going on stage is humiliating, but I don't really care because these people are going to die anyways. Like that's how, that's how I see things. It's just like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this gig and I'm going to sing in front of a, bun a room full of people and my voice might go out of tune. Um, but these people are going to die. And when they die, they're not going to remember me anyway. So I don't really care. Does that make sense? You know, anyways, maybe I shouldn't have ended on that question because I feel like this is a dark way to end the podcast, but thank you, Anonymous. I really appreciate your question. Um, if anybody else has anything to add to that conversation, please do so in the comment section below. And that's it for today. I'm actually going to head out now because I'm going to be heading to the open mic um, in Scotty's in New Jersey. Um, before I leave, if you liked anything, if you didn't like anything, I really enjoy when people comment in the comment section below. I know I'm kind of like selling myself here to try to get like, you know, people to listen to my podcast, but listen, it's what I have to do to get this done. Um, so help me out here. Start a little conversation in the comment section. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit like. Um, and remember, this is a podcast slash music channel. Um, you can see weekly podcasts here and then you can also see on the other weeks music covers and soon to come original music on here um and that's it for today guys i hope you enjoyed this podcast episode i had a lot of fun i actually really enjoy these question and answers a lot so i'm definitely going to do this again um and that's it take care guys bye